Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you today. We know how solemn, how serious is this moment as we view the children of Israel at the site of Mount Sinai where they heard your voice, where they saw the thunderings, where they saw the great, great thunderings and the lightnings that really made them afraid. It was a solemn moment. You have recorded this for us so that we'll view your majesty and your greatness. And so that we'll be able to reach what they heard. And we'll be able to have communicated into our hearts what you communicated with them. And therefore, Lord, as we come together to study these solemn and serious words, we pray that, Lord, the solemnity of the moment will be so real in our own heart, so that we'll worship you, so that we will exalt you, and so that our hearts will be open to your very word, and will serve you acceptably in Jesus' name. O oh Lord, we pray that in our worship today, there will be orderliness. And every one of us will be attentive as we hear these important words of the Lord. Speak to our hearts, Lord, and grant us the grace that we we'll live in your presence, abide in your word, and be obedient to everything that you'll have to teach us from your word. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' name, we pray. Today we come to the study of Exodus chapter 20. Obviously, a very important chapter. And this is a chapter that is foundational to quite a lot of things in Scripture. It was foundational to the relationship of the children of Israel with the Almighty God. It was foundational to their understanding of the covenant that the Lord just made with them. It was foundational to the ministry of the prophets and the kings and the peace of the children of Israel. You will find that in the books of the kings, as well as in the prophets, as well as in the judges, you will see the emphasis as to refer back to this particular chapter, as to the law that God had revealed to the children of Israel. In fact, all the rebukes, all the correction, all the scattering, going to captivity, you'll find it's because they neglected this that we're going to study today. And as we come on to the New Testament, you will not fail to see. If you read very clearly how those uh, people in the New Testament, beginning from John the Baptist, how they emphasize once again obedience to the commandments of the law. Then Jesus Christ came and he emphasized the spiritual significance of the law of God. Not only that, as we look at the epistles, you see the foundation of the doctrines, talking about Jesus Christ, talking about the grace of God, talking about faith in Christ, and eventually leading us to what it really means to have the grace of God, which means that it will lead us to love the Lord and love our neighbor. And eventually everything com comes back again to how do we relate with one another? How do we live? What is our conduct? And so you find till the end of uh, the revelation of God. As you read in, the, in Revelation, you'll see that in the closing verses of the closing chapters, it tells us very clearly once again that there will be judgment. How will they be judged? They will be judged according to the word of God. Those who are righteous will get into life everlasting. But those who are righteous and disobedient, they will be punished. Well then, something that is so basic, so fundamental to our understanding of Scripture should be taken very seriously. That's why we come to this chapter today with the understanding that we need the Spirit of God to explain to us and to make us see what the Lord will have us see. We also need the grace of God so that after learning these things, we will be able to do as He instructs us to do. Last week, we looked at Exodus chapter 19. And in Exodus chapter 19, we saw God descending upon Mount Sinai. And the mountain just came in smokes. It was a terrible sight. If you look at Exodus chapter 19 verse 16, it says, And it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud upon the mount and a voice of the trumpet exceeding loud so that all the people that was in the camp trembled. God came to speak to them. And he spoke to them in that condition. And when he spoke to them, they heard his voice. The word of God says they actually trembled. In Deuteronomy chapter 5 and verse 22. 
Deuteronomy chapter 5 verse 22. And I want you to realize that this Deuteronomy chapter 5 is connected with the giving of the law of God, the commandments of the Lord. If you read from verse 6 all through to verse 21, you will see that these are repetitions of the commandments of the Lord. Here is the conclusion. Verse 22. These words the Lord spake unto all your assembly in the mount, out of the midst of the fire, and of the cloud, and of the thick darkness, with a great voice, and he, uh, he added no more. And he wrote them in two tables of stone, and delivered them unto me. So then you will see the sight that the children of Israel saw. You will feel how the children of Israel felt. God gave them this word. I'm, I'm sure you know that it wasn't a means of salvation. They were already saved. They were already redeemed. They have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. We have studied about their redemption in Exodus chapter 12. But you see over here now, he was giving them the commandments so that these commandments will be for them the rules for guidance. Since these people had already received the commandment or the covenant of the Lord, they were now to see that obedience was a condition to the continuation of that covenant or continuing in the covenant. These words then became the basis of their continuing with the, with the Lord as the people of God. These commandments of God are an exhibition of God's righteousness or God's righteous standard. And they provided a means for the children of Israel through which they could measure their conformity to God's holiness. Now you know that in the ministry of Jesus Christ, he was never antagonistic against the law of God. In fact, in his ministry, he upheld the law, the commandments. He taught the commandments. He established the commandments. He showed the true spiritual meaning and significance of the commandments of the Lord. What did he do? To the commandments of the Lord, especially knowing that the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes had muddled up everything, confused everybody. What did Jesus do with the law? What did he do? He restored the proper meaning and the spiritual significance of the law. And he revealed the right way in which it should be obeyed. He himself rendered perfect obedience to its precepts. And by his death on the cross of Calvary, he paid the penalty of the broken law on Abiyah. Now he imparts the love for God and also the love for man. So that himself he said that all the commandments of the Lord are summarized under two subheadings. Subheading number one, love towards God. Subheading number two, love towards our neighbor. And then we're told in Romans chapter 13 verse 10 that love is the fulfilling of the law. It is this law God wants to look at in particular today. We'll be taking just the, this one single study. Because if you've been with us in the church, you will know that when I was dealing with Romans chapter 3, verse 31, I took eight studies, eight Sundays, to deal with all these commandments of the Lord. And so if you want a fuller detail, fuller treatment of these commandments, you'll have to refer to those eight cases dealing with the commandments of the Lord, the Ten Commandments in particular. And now a person that has believed on the Lord, a person that is now in faith, a person that has faith in Christ, how he relates to the law of God. That will give you the detail. And although we had studied this before in that series, yet as we come, in our study of Exodus now, we cannot just pass it over. We cannot overlook it because I believe the Spirit of the Lord still has something to reveal to every one of us today. I pray that you'll be open to the Lord. You'll be submissive to the Word of the Lord. And you'll be teachable so that whatever the Spirit of God still wants to show you in your own life, it will show you as we look at all these things today. The chapter has been divided into three parts. Part one is commandments dealing with love towards God. And if there is anything we need to know, we need to know how do we love God? How do we express our love towards God? See, He has done so much for us. He gave His only begotten Son. That whosoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. What should we do in response to His love? 
we should love him. How do we love him? Well, we'll see as we consider point number one, commandments dealing with love towards God. Number two, commandments dealing with love towards our neighbors. If he has loved us so much, what's the conclusion? We need also to love one another. As you see the love of God for you, there's only one thing you'll want to do. A response coming from your heart, that will be, I need to love my fellow brother. I need to love my fellow sister. See, all that I've done, he has forgiven me. He has taken everything away. He has manifested his love towards me. And so the conclusion is that I ought to love my neighbor. In fact, you know what Jesus said? He said by this, shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one towards another. That's why it's so important for you and for me to review once again and to listen once again to these commandments dealing with love towards our neighbors. After hearing about those commandments dealing with our love towards God and our love towards our neighbors, what will be the next thing? The next thing will be that we consecrate ourselves. Knowing God, we consecrate ourselves to worship Him. And we worship with pure worship. And we commit ourselves to loving one another and to keeping the commandments of the Lord. So, that will bring us to the third part, consecration and pure worship. Let's start now from point number one. Pleading with the God of all grace. To be so gracious to us, to reveal His might to us. And at the same time, to strengthen us to walk in the way of God's righteousness. In Exodus chapter 20. Reading from verse 1. And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, We brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. I want you to realize, to start with, that God had manifested his love towards them. And they were no more strangers to the Lord. They were the people of God. God said in verse 2, I am the Lord thy God. Would you understand then that the foundation of all these commandments is that we come to the Lord first. First, you know the Lord. And after knowing the Lord, being redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, then you are ready to receive the commandment of the Lord. Then he also expressed what he has done. In expressing what he had done, he was expressing to the children of Israel, see what I've done. See how I've loved you. And this is now the, uh, the consequence of my love. If I have loved you this way, here is what you are to do. Which means then, the foundation or the basis of the commandments we are going to read is the very love of God. What did he do for them in his love? He said in verse 2, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Exodus chapter 19, verse 4. Ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians. And now I bear you on eagles' wings and brought you unto myself. He said, I've expressed my love to you. I've borne you on eagles' wings, above difficulties, above plagues. And I've taken you out of the house of slavery. And I've now brought you unto myself. You were separated from me by your sins before. But now there is a reconciliation. You are brought unto myself. I've shown my love to you. What I'm expecting from you now is that you too, you will love me. In Deuteronomy chapter 6. Deuteronomy chapter 6. Reading from verse 3. Hear therefore, O Israel, and observe to do it, that it may be well with thee, and that ye may increase mightily, as the Lord God of thy fathers hath promised thee, in the land which floweth with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. What are we to do? Verse 5. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy might. Do you then understand? All these commandments we are going to read, what it's expressing is in one word, love the Lord your God. That's all. That's all it requires. And it requires that in every generation. We cannot say only the Old Testament people were to love the Lord their God. We cannot say, now in this dispensation of grace, because we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, love is no more required. No, love is still there. He loved us. He's still loving us now. He wants to continue loving us. And he wants us to keep on loving him. In fact, look at what Jesus said concerning these commandments in Matthew chapter 22. Matthew chapter 22. From verse 
37. Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. Jesus said, at the very time he was still living, he said, it has not changed. You will still love the Lord. God will never tolerate at any time, any dispensation, any period, the people that hate him. He wants us to love him. Then he said in verse 38, this is the first and the great commandment. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Look at the conclusion in verse 20. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. All the law and the prophets, they hang on this one thing, love. The two branches of love, one branch, love your God. Second branch, love your neighbor. And then in John chapter 14, John chapter 14, verse 15. This is very, very clear. Open and see it for yourself. In John chapter 14, verse 15, if he love me, keep my commandment isn't that so straightforward and so simple it says if you love me there's one thing you are going to do you are going to take my commandment seriously and you are going to keep my commandment so then god gave the law as an act of love and the redeemed of the lord will make love the basis upon which the law of god is received jesus christ our lord and savior already i've shown you that that he declared that the requirements of the law are all summed up in loving God with all our hearts and loving our neighbor as ourselves. So then, love towards God and love towards men will be the, will be the basis of these commandments of God and this love is necessary in all men, in all generations. The believer's obedience today to God's commandments will spring from a heart full of love towards God. Now, let's look briefly now at the commandments relating to our love towards God. There are four of them. The first four commandments out of ten relate to God directly. And the last six relate to our neighbors. Let's look at numbers one to four of the commandments of God. We'll pick them one by one. Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20. The first commandment is in verse 3. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. That's very simple. And when you really know who God is, you know the greatness of God, the supremacy of God, you know the very fact that God is supreme and that God is the only true God, you will know that all other things and all other people that claim to be God, they are false gods. And therefore you will not have anything to do with them. This first commandment prohibits every form of idolatry and all inordinate attachment to any material or as listening. Inordinate attachment. Because you see, Jesus Christ himself said, you cannot serve God and mammon. You cannot have your love, your devotion, your adoration, your veneration. You cannot have that for any other personality or any other thing. Because it says, thou shalt have no other gods before me. It means then that we are to choose, we are to worship, we are to serve the Lord, the only true God. And in fact, when it says, thou shalt have no other gods before me, that means you will not give to anyone or anything in heaven on earth that in what has affection that is due to God alone. Or the worship, or the loving veneration, or the faith, or the dependence that is God's due alone. You will not give that to anyone or anything else. In fact, look at what the language of the true believer ought to be in Psalm 73. Psalm 73, reading from verse 25. Whom have I in heaven but thee, and there is none upon the earth beside thee. It means you are not going to take anyone in heaven. Abraham, Jacob, Isaac, Paul. Peter, anyone, you are not going to take any of them as God. You are not even going to worship any angel. You will not bow down to an angel. You will not take an angel as a God. And you will not take any living man as God. Whatever is influence and whatever is uh, popularity, whatever is fame, you will not take any man on earth as God. Because it's not God. Neither are you going to make money your God. Neither are you going to make any material thing we can see. You cannot make any other thing your God. 
Verse 25 again. Who am I in heaven but thee? That will be your devotion. That will be your consecration. That will be your very heart. And there is none upon the earth that I desire beside thee. There is none on earth, there is none in heaven that you worship except God. That you adore except God. That you have faith in except God. That you depend upon except God. It means really that you are giving completely, totally unto the Lord. In Matthew chapter 4, verse 10. Matthew chapter 4, verse 10. Then says Jesus unto him, Get thee hands, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only, him only, him only, shalt thou serve. The devil brought temptation to the Lord Jesus Christ. Can you imagine that? And I need to tell you this. If the devil will tempt our own Lord, if the devil will, will tempt Jesus Christ, the very Son of God, don't you know that he can bring temptation your way? To have another God, a false God, worship another thing, maybe to worship yourself, worship your beauty, worship your intelligence, or worship your, your achievement, or worship uh, maybe your possession, or worship money, and give all your heart, and give all your love, and give all your time, and give everything you have to just make him money? Don't you think that he'll want to say, well, you can even worship the devil, or worship idol, or have masquerade, or all these festivities, but you will not have any other God beside the Lord. It means that you are going to worship the Lord and the Lord and the Lord alone, the only true God. Now, commandment number two. This one tells us that we are not to make graven images to be worshipped. We are not to make graven images to be worshipped. Look at it. In Exodus chapter 20 and verse 4 through to verse 6. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. Or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the waters under, under the earth. This is telling you whether in heaven, on earth, or under the earth, you will not make any image. You will not carve out any image for you to worship, which is telling us you cannot make the image of an angel image of a man, image of a woman, image of a child, image of an animal, image of birds, image of anything, whatever, whether on sea, in the sea, or on land, you will not make any image to bow down to. Verse 5, for thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generations of them that hate me. Two things come out of that verse. That bowing down to an idol will be an iniquity. That's what he calls the iniquity of the fathers. And also, something comes out here that you see many times a father will say, this is what I've been worshipping. And therefore you, my child, that is what to worship you. If your father is an idol worshipper, you cannot continue to worship idols with your father or with your mother or with your relatives. Or you'll say, this is a family religion. No, it is not your religion. You must believe on the Lord Jesus Christ who came to die for you. Then it uses the word in the last line. It uses the word hate. Hate. That is, it says, the people that actually bow down to idols. The consequence or the conclusion is that they hate the Lord. You see that? That if you're an idol worshiper, although the idol worshiper may give an excuse, and he will say, we think God is so big. We think God is so great. That is why we don't want to approach God directly. And that's why we're going through this intermediary of an angel, of a man, of an idol, of an image, of a tree, or of stone, or whatever. It says if you do that, you hate the Lord. Then it says in verse 6, And showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. It said if you refrain from making idols and images and worshipping them, you are revealing your love, your love unto him. Can you see once again that these commandments are the basis of loving God? They are the evidences of the marks of the people that actually love God. When you are keeping the commandments of God, according to that verse 6, you are revealing your heart of love and gratitude towards the Lord. In fact, those who worship idols and they make a graving images to worship them, the Bible makes us understand that they are not reasonable. In Psalm 115, 
Psalm 115. From verse 3. But our God is in the heavens. He has done whatsoever has pleased him. Now look at verse 4. Their idols are silver and gold. The work of men's hands. Their mouths, but they speak not. Eyes are they, but they see not. They have ears, but they hear not. No seas are they, but they smell not. They have hands, but they undo not. Feet are they, but they walk not. Neither speak they through their throat. They that make them. Those who make those idols, those graven images, those that make them are like unto them. So is everyone that trusteth in them. You see, the Lord does not want you to trust in idols at all. He wants you to serve, to worship the only true God. And when we worship God, we don't worship God through images. We don't say, well, because I cannot see God, I want to see something so that I'll be able to make a representation of the invisible God in my mind. That's what some religious people, they even call themselves a brand of a Christian. They call themselves Christians. But the Bible says they are idol worshippers. Look at it in John chapter 4, verses 23 and 24. For the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshippers, notice that, the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. He is invisible, therefore you don't represent him with any image. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is the spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. What's the New Testament telling you and telling me? You have First John chapter 5, verse 21. First John chapter 5, verse 21. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. They introduce it to you from the village. Your neighbors may even introduce it to you. They may bring things sacrificed to idols. Or they may tell you that a particular problem can only be solved through idols. Little children, those of you who believe in the Lord, keep yourselves from idols. The third commandment we find in Exodus Chapter 20 and verse 7. This third commandment is telling us not to take the name of God in vain. Exodus chapter 20 and verse 7. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. For the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. I'm sure you will come, you would have come across people that will joke and jest. For the name of the Lord. I'm sure you would have seen people before that maybe in their drinking orgies in the nightclub, they might be singing the songs of, uh, you know, the sin, the songs and the psalms, or they might uh, be joking and jesting with the name of the Lord. I'm sure you would have heard some of the people between boys and girls, men and women, who might be playing and jesting with the name of the Lord. I'm sure that you would have seen people that in their free moment, their leisure hours, the time when uh, they are not sober and serious when they think they are having light time. That they will be jesting with the Bible, the word of God, the name of God, the titles of God, or the things related to worship. Those are the people taking the name of the Lord in vain. And the Bible says such people are guilty. He will not hold him guiltless. That means he will hold him guilty. That takes the name of the Lord in vain. The name of the Lord is to be held with the utmost solemnity and reverence because of his majesty and dignity. God's name is sacred. And whatsoever, whatever we think or say of him shall reflect his excellency, shall correspond to the sacred sublimity of his name, and shall turn to the exaltation of his magnificence. Anything pertaining to God shall be spoken of with the greatest sobriety. This commandment therefore prohibits all needless, flippant, profane, Blasphemous mention of God's name, any irreverent use of his name and word. And the name of the Lord is to be reverenced. In fact, we are told in Psalm 111, Psalm 111. This is such a significant verse, I'm sure you might have marked it even in your Bible. In verse 9, he sent redemption unto his people. He has commanded his covenant forever. Look at this. Holy and reverent is his name. Holy and reverent is his name. 
Well, for us, the New Testament dispensation, Jesus Christ has even deepened and heightened and broadened this commandment. He has widened it too. He has told us that we should not even swear. We should not swear at all. Neither should we use the name of God in swearing. In uh, Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, reading from verse 34. But I say unto you, swear not at all. Swear not at all. Whether in the court or in the house or elsewhere, swear not at all. Neither by heaven, for it is God's throne. Nor by the earth, for it is his footstool. Neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Neither shall thou swear by thy head, because thou canst not make one air white or black. How are we to discuss? But let your communication be yea, yea. That means yes, yes, nay, nay, no, no. For whatsoever is more than this cometh of evil. Look at James chapter 5. James chapter 5, reading from verse 12. But above all things, my brethren, swear not, swear not, neither by heaven, neither by the earth, neither by any other oath. You cannot swear by the name of the Lord, neither by any other oath. But let your yea be yea, and your nay, nay, lest ye fall into condemnation. So then, we're not to take the name of the Lord in vain. We go to commandment number four. This is telling us that we should remember the Lord's day, to keep it holy. And it means that we're to worship and rest on God's holy day. You see, there is a slight difference in spelling and pronunciation between holy day and holiday. Holiday, that's just one word. But there is a difference of spelling between holiday and holy day. But do you know that many people today, they take the Lord's day not as a holy day for worship, for remembering God, for reading the word of God, for serving the Lord. They take it as a holiday. That's why you find them at the bar beach. That's why you find them playing games. That's why you find them going about taking pictures and having fun fear, having this or that. We are to respect and honor the day of the Lord. And we are to remember it is the one single day the Lord has given us that we will remember his name and we will worship the Lord. For the children of Israel, God's holy day was the Sabbath day which was Saturday. For us now living on this side of the cross, the Lord's day, which is God's holy day, the day of worship for us, for us is the first day of the week. I'm sure you know this already, but let's refresh our memory. As we look at the word of God in Exodus chapter 20, reading to you from verse 8. Exodus chapter 20 from verse 8. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. That is, that's why it's called Holy Day of the Lord. It's a Sabbath day, but keep it holy. Six days thou shalt labor and do all thy work. I, I want you to realize that that verse 9 is as much a commandment as the rest of the chapter. Six days thou shalt labor. The Lord hates idleness, laziness. He wants us to work, and you must work. There must be a way of expending energy. In fact, he says, it is through the sweat of your face that you will eat. He expects us to labor. Labor with your hands. Labor with your brain. And make sure that you are doing a very tangible, profitable thing. And a legitimate thing do, too. Then it says in verse 10, But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work. Thou, nor thy son nor thy daughter, nor thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day, and hallowed it, honored it, set it apart. Then he honored it so much, he now demands that you keep that day apart from, for him, and you worship him. Now, I told you that concerning the children of Israel in particular, he gave them the seventh day, which is the Sabbath day or Saturday. Now, see that that related with it to Israel in particular in Deuteronomy chapter 5. Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 15. 
and remember that thou was a servant in the land of Egypt, and that the Lord thy God brought thee out thence through a mighty hand and a stretched out arm. Just listen to the next word. Therefore, therefore, because you are Israelites, because you are delivered out of Egypt, therefore the Lord thy God commanded thee to keep the Sabbath day. That's for Israel in particular. But now I, but those of us on this side of the cross who have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, those of us who have been redeemed by the Lord Jesus Christ and cleansed in his blood, is it now Saturday again that we're still worshipping? No, not at all. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 2. Do you know it already? 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 2. Upon the first day of the week, upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store, as God has prospered him, that there will be no gatherings when I come. It says you want to gather together. Then gather together on that first day of the week. And uh, this is the commandment that he gave to all the churches in Galatia. You see it in verse 1 concerning the collection for the saints as I have given order to the churches of Galatia. Even so do ye. And so the first day of the week became the day of worship and rest. In Acts chapter 20 verse 7. And upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continued his speech until midnight. You see, this is why we do not allow some legalistic people to come and put the yoke of the Sabbath Saturday upon the believer today. In fact, we are told in Colossians chapter 2, Colossians chapter 2, that we are not uh, supposed now to come under the rigid laws of the Sabbath Saturday worship. In Colossians chapter 2 and in verse 16, Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day and of a new moon and of the Sabbath days. Of Sabbath days. Why? Because in verse 17, there is shadow of things to come but the body is of christ reality has now come and that is jesus christ and because jesus has now come and that is the reality he has saved us and redeemed us therefore we now worship on the day of the lord which is sunday and we devote that day unto the lord to really worship the lord but uh, as we worship the lord on the lord's day on sunday uh, are there are some kind of work that sometimes will be called upon to do and we can do with a clear conscience and the free conscience. That is true. And uh, following after the example of the Lord Jesus Christ, we learn that there are works of necessity. What kinds of work will be that? That will be work that you cannot postpone until the coming day. And you could not have done on, the, on an earlier day, such as caring for the sea such as ministering the word of God. In fact, we are told that even the priests, they ministered on those Sabbath days and made all those sacrifices, and yet they were guiltless in the sight of God. Also the work of mercy and compassion. Jesus spoke about an animal falling into the ditch, and then the owner picking it up, because um, they had to do the work of mercy and the work of compassion. Remember once again, all these commandments are the expressions of our love towards the Lord. We now want to go to point number two, which is uh, God's commandments dealing with love towards our neighbor. Love towards our neighbor. Now look at this in Exodus chapter 20, reading from verse 12 to verse 17. Exodus chapter 20 from verse 12. Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land, which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. I want you to see once again that the basis of these commandments, the basis is love. Love. That is all this is saying is that you love your neighbor so much, you honor and obey your father and your mother. 
You love your neighbor so much you will not kill him. You love your neighbor so much you will not commit adultery with his wife or with her husband. You love your neighbor so much you preserve his property and you will not steal from him. You love your neighbor so much you are not going to bear false witness to get him into trouble. You love your neighbor so much you allow him to enjoy what he has and do not covet what he has. In Romans chapter 13. Romans chapter 13, reading from verse 8. Oh, no man anything but to love one another. For he that loveth another has fulfilled the law. You see that? He that loveth another has fulfilled the law. All that the Lord, is, the Lord is requiring from you here is just to love. Just to love. And when you really love, you'll see that you'll behave, you'll conduct your life in a way that others will live and be happy with you. In verse 9. For this thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment, you see that? And if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. The conclusion is in verse 10. Love walketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. In fact, this is what Jesus said in another place, in another way, which people have now referred to as the golden rule. The golden rule. Look at it in Matthew chapter 7, verse 12. Therefore, all things whatsoever ye would that men should do unto you, do ye even so to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Would you want your, your own children to honor you and to obey you? Oh, yes. All things whatsoever ye would that others should do unto you, do ye even so to them? Will you want other people to respect your life, not to touch your life, not to cause you pain, not to kill you? Oh, yes. All things whatsoever ye would that men should do unto you, do ye even so to them? You don't want others to kill you. You cannot kill others too. Would you want other people to so love you and uh, to set your wife apart just for you and to leave your husband just for you and not commit adultery or immorality with them? Oh yes, that's what you want. Well, the word of God is, therefore, all things whatsoever ye would that men should do unto you, do ye even so to them? You don't want them to touch your wife, don't touch their wife. You don't want them to commit immorality with your husband, don't commit immorality with their husband. And then it says, the word of God says, Thou shalt not bear false witness. Thou shalt not steal. Isn't this exactly what you want from others? You don't want them to touch your property. You don't want them to covet your wife or your property or your house. You don't want them to bear false witness against you. All this is just telling us that if you want them to love you, love them too. Love your neighbor as yourself. And dare anyone tell us then that because we now believe in Christ, all these commandments are useless? All these commandments are no more necessary, that we can live lawless lives, that we can, we can kill, we can commit adultery, we can steal, we can bear false witness, we can covet, or we can dishonor our parents, even our parents in the law too. Does anybody tell us that because we're under grace, we're not under the law, we can do as we please? No, that will be a misinterpretation of the word of God. Already we learned yesterday that we are dead to the law. So that we can be alive unto God. And if we're alive unto God, we're going to honor God. We're going to respect God. We're going to keep the commandments of the Lord. Let's look at them briefly one by one. The fifth commandment. Honoring our parents. This is Exodus chapter 20 verse 12. Honor thy father and thy mother. That thy days may be long as the promise of God. That thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Well, I just need to show you that this is repeated in the New Testament. In Ephesians chapter 6, reading from verse 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. For this is right. It's always right. In the Old Testament, it was right. In the New Testament, it is still right. Obey your parents in the Lord. For this is right. For those of us enjoying the grace of God, it's still right. For those of us who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, that's the right thing to do. For those of us who say we're not under the law, we're under grace, this is still the right thing to do. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long upon the earth. 
So then, we are being told here that we are to honor and obey our parents. This is so basic that it is universal in human society. Obedience has to do with our action towards our parents, while honor has to do with our heart attitude towards our parents. One is not sufficient without the other. That is, we cannot just say, well, I'm obeying them, I'm obeying them, without honoring them. Neither can we say, oh, I love them so much, I honor them so much, although we're not obeying them. Children, this is so important. Children are to abstain from whatever would grieve or sadden or offend their parents. Uh, but however, there is one limitation. Children are not to obey the parents if the parents instruct them to sin or to lie or to do evil. It's unfortunate there are some parents that tell their children to sin. They tell their children, tell that person coming, I'm not at home. Or they will tell their children to do things that are evil. And they will say, you know the condition is right now. Can't you go out and, and also give, give your body to men so you can bring money to this house? Do you want us to just continue like this in hunger? Children, the children are to obey their parents, but only in the Lord. If they command us contrary to the commandments of the Lord, we are to say politely, no, because we belong to the Lord. Commandment number six, thou shalt not kill. That's what you'll find in Exodus chapter 20 and verse 13. Thou shalt not kill. This commandment is telling us of how life is precious. In fact, life is man's most prized possession. And it is a great sin to deprive another person of his own life. Those who assist in the crime of mother, mother or those who support and consent to or conceal the sin of murder, they are guilty before the Lord. You also want to understand that suicide is a self-murder. And it's a great sin which precludes repentance, and that sin leads directly, leads the self-murderer directly to hell fire. Of course, those who commit abortion, the sin against God, the sin against the innocent blood, the sin against the church, the sin against the kingdom of God, the sin against humanity. We are to honor, we are to respect, we are to take as sacred the life of another person, of our neighbor. And we are not supposed to kill. Jesus Christ tells us uh, that it's even more than the overt, outward, open action. He tells us that even in our own hearts, we should not bear grudge or hatred or malice or animosity. In Matthew chapter 5. Verse 22, But I say unto you, that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother Reka shall be in danger of the council. And whosoever shall say thou fool shall be in danger of hellfire. You want to understand that all these punishments shall be in danger of the judgment, in danger of the council, hellfire, they are capital punishments. And they are very, very serious things. The Lord does not allow us to even bear so much grudge or have so much anger or have so much malice and bitterness that we'll use uh, a very bad language, abusive word uh, on our neighbor. And not on your child. You cannot just call your child fool, dog, idiot, and things like that. We're not allowed to use those kinds of words on our children, on our wives, on our husband, on our friends, on our neighbors on a fellow brother or sister in the church. Uh, you know, the leader cannot be so unhappy with the worker that he will talk to a worker in the church and say, you fool, you idiot, non-entity. And that means that we don't even have the grace of God. We're not living right. We do not have the liberty to use such languages. In First John chapter 3, First John chapter 3 and verse 15, Whosoever hated his brother is a murderer. Now, you may not even speak a word, a single word. You may not break out in open, terrible anger. Uh, you may not break out with a, a quarrel, some kind of attitude. You may just bottle it in and allow the bitterness to stay there. Uh, is this uh, a lifelong bitterness and hatred against your fellow brother, your fellow sister? Whosoever hated his brother is a murderer. And this you know. Ye know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Isn't that a very serious word that we need to consider, that we need to look at? Uh, not only that, let's now go to commandment number seven, which says, Thou shalt not commit 
adultery. Very straightforward and very pointed. It says in Exodus chapter 20 and verse 14, Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not commit adultery. This is seventh commandment. Here is the word of the Lord for us. This commandment is applicable to all kinds of immorality. It means there should be no fornication, no adultery, no homosexuality, no lesbianism. That is, a woman and a woman, a lady and another lady, uh, getting together and uh, messing up together as if they were husband and wife. Masturbation, that's evil, that's unclean. Uncleanness, in fact, with this commandment is setting us to abstain from all things that will excite the evil passion and the loss of the flesh, such as immodest dress. You know that, you know that immodest dress, a woman not covering her nakedness, or a man not covering his uh, nakedness properly, and uh, opening, uh, you know, the shared chest and all that. You see, immoral speech too. All that can uh, de degrade you and degenerate into eventually evil thoughts and evil desires and immorality. Of course, pornography pictures. A child of God should have nothing to do with magazines that have nude pictures of men or women. Or nude pictures of, a, of, a, of a ladies that will excite your uh, base uh, part, the fleshly part of you. Unclean thoughts and actions, you should not, uh, you should not remain in these things. Jesus made it very clear that adultery is found in the heart and it occurs in the heart before any outward action. God is pure and holy and he requires us to flee from all unrighteousness. All unrighteousness. And I could learn yesterday in Romans chapter 7, if your husband is still alive, you go to marry another person, then you'll be an adulteress. If your wife is still alive, and then you leave that one, you go to marry another person, you'll be an adulterer. Commandment number 8. It says in Exodus chapter 20, verse 15, Thou shalt not steal. This is clear. Everybody knows what that means. It means that theft uh, is wrong. It's a sin in the sight of God. And that is an unjust taking or keeping to ourselves what is lawfully belonging to another. He is a thief who withholds what ought to be in his neighbor's possession. Just as much as one who takes his neighbor's property from him. And you could take your neighbor's property by deceit or by false or by fraud. It is still stealing. This commandment places a sacred enclosure around our neighbor's property which none can lawfully take without his consent. You see, we should be very careful. Those of us who say we're Christians. Uh, I, I'm surprised sometimes you'll find some people and you come to their houses, you find the spoon and the knife and the fork of the airline that you were walking with. Or you find some people, you, you find the cups and the plates and, and the biros of their place of work. Or you find some people that are walking in some place and they, uh, they will have a fish, a frozen fish and, and meat and they will put it under their clothes and under a wrapper and take it home without permission. Or you find some people that will, you know, just change their accounts and change receipts and uh, they are making unlawful gain from their employers. Or you find some women that uh, in these uh, days of uh, difficulty and austerity, you find these women that they will uh, take money belonging to the family to go and put somewhere in a local bank. You know what I mean. And uh, they will say, well, one has to be wise today. You know, that kind of wisdom is stealing. And it is wrong in the sight of the Lord. Uh, you know, so it's very common with uh, uh, stamps. Uh, you know, you take stamps from your place of work. You take virus from your place of work. You just take all this system without any permission at all. I'm not sure if you are given permission to do it and it is known uh, and it is accepted and it's, uh, it's, uh, it's accepted there in your place of work. That's all right. But when you know it is not accepted and you are taking these things without permission, let us live careful lives. Careful lives. In fact, we're told that uh, we should be very careful of stealing. In Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. Reading from verse 28. Let him that stole steal no more. That's a good word. That's a good word. For those of us who are stealing before, now you are a child of God. Let him that stole steal no more. But rather let him labor walking with his sons. The thing which is good that he may have to give to him that needeth. That's the word of God for those of us who are children of God. Don't continue to steal. Now, the ninth commandment, no false witness. 
It says in Exodus chapter 20 and verse 16, Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. God forbid false witness, lying, deception, giving a false testimony in a court of law or any other place. A lie consists of three elements. Speaking what is not true. Second part of it, deliberately doing so. The third part of it, doing so with a purpose and intent to deceive. Now, let, let's examine ourselves with all these things. A young man goes to the marriage committee. He wants to get married. And the very first question they ask him, have you told her what comes out of him? If he's not born again, although he thinks he's born again. If he's backsliding, although he thinks he's a worker. If he's not a child of God, although he carries a large Bible, a big Bible, he tells a lie. No, I've never spoken to her. And you know the truth. Or sometimes it is that you know that already some unclean things have been going on between you. And then you come to the marriage committee, you want to finalize the courtship, you now want to go ahead and get married. And uh, the first question that comes, uh, are you sure you've been living clean together? Oh yes, we're living clean together. I about to say, oh yes, we never, never, never did anything that was questionable. You know it's a lie, you know it's a lie. And when you talk to deceive like that, you are breaking the commandment of the Lord. Why don't we speak the truth and let the devil be ashamed? Why don't we speak the truth, live righteous lives, and let us stand firm by the word of God? Because, you know, if we're standing by the word of God, we'll be able to preserve this pure doctrine of the word of God to the coming generation if Jesus tarries. Therefore, we're told that we should not bear false witness. No lie, no deception, no giving of false testimony. We shouldn't do it in church. We shouldn't do it at home. We shouldn't do it in the court. There's another thing here. A report should never be repeated until its truth is verified. And you know, sometimes uh, this happens so much in the family. The wife has had something about brother so-and-so, about sister so-and-so. Sister, have you verified it? No. Why are you telling your husband? You are passing across a lie, an unfounded statement, a statement we have not very verified. Husband, sometimes you hear quite a lot. You hear about brother so and so, about sister so and so. If you come to the house, you can talk about other things. You can talk about the word of God. You can talk about the message we have today. You can talk about your prayer life. You can talk about beautiful, wonderful things. You can talk about your plan for life. You can talk about a lot of good, good things. But we don't do that. We begin to talk about uh, my wife. Did you know, brother so and so, sister so and so? My brother, that story you are talking about, have you verified it? No, you have not. Well, don't you know that? You can discover that it is false. And you have a lot of restitution to make. How many people are you going to be getting to? I'm sorry, that thing I shared, that thing I said, that thing I reported, I never verified it. Now I know it is not true. Let us be very careful. Those who maliciously invent a falsehood for the purpose of damaging the reputation or the character of the life, of their neighbors, they are guilty of a great sin in the sight of God. In fact, liars, we are told, will not get to the kingdom of God. In Revelation chapter 21, Revelation chapter 21, and we're looking at verse 8. Revelation 21, verse 8. It says, uh, But the fearful and the unbelieving and the abominable and the murderers and the whoremongers and the sorcerers and the idolaters, listen to this, and all liars. Those who, eh, those who carry about stories, they never verify and they tell lies. All liars shall have their parts in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Now, commandment number 10 it says, Thou shalt not covet. Eh, you see, for the natural man who does not know the Lord, when your eyes see, your heart desires. Your eyes see, your heart desires and be very careful that that desire does not degenerate into evil desire into loss into wanting to grieve and grab everything having a possessive attitude in uh, exodus chapter 20 verse 17 thou shalt not cover thy neighbor's house it's better than yours praise the lord for that more spacious than yours praise the lord for that it's in a conspicuous place praise the lord for that there's a good shot in front of it that Oh, it should have been a good thing to have this house. And one will make a great, a good market in this strategic place. Praise the Lord for that. But don't covet it. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. No, the, uh, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife. She's younger. 
looks more beautiful, well-dressed, well-educated, and bringing money to her own family, praise the Lord, but don't covet your neighbor's wife. She is industrious and, and she's taking care of her children and she is, uh, she's developing her children and her children are, you know, getting good grades in school. Praise the Lord for that. But do not covet thy neighbor's wife. You know, she's so quiet and spiritual and she really behaves in a matured way that everybody respects her. Praise the Lord for that. But thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife. Your own wife is giving you trouble. Your own wife, you, you're having difficulty with her. Well, make sure that you pray and pray through that God will make a change, a transformation in your wife. But don't covet your neighbor's wife. You're having a, a serious problem with the relationship between you and your wife. And therefore, that is making your mind withdrawn from your own wife. And you're looking at another person's wife. Be careful. Be careful. Because the heart is deceitful above all things. And who can know it? Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife nor is man servant, nor is maid servant, those who are walking with him, nor is ox, nor is ass, those days the ox and the ass were the beasts of burden, those who are carrying things or plowing or, or doing whatever, or, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. We have to be very careful and very watchful. You do not have any covetous attitude, any illegitimate, inordinate desire, any wrong desire towards anything belonging to your neighbor. This commandment forbids us to covet anything that is our neighbor's. This commandment forbids the inward desire to have whatever others possess. All sins begin in the heart, and God condemns evil desires in the heart. Many people who appear, you know this, many people who appear to be innocent of wrongdoing on the basis of outward acts are nevertheless condemned because of their inward thoughts and covetous uh, desires for their neighbor's wife or property. Such evil desires will need to be purged by the blood of Jesus. Well, we, we looked at the Ten Commandments, so we looked at the first part and the second part. I'm sure you know that these are very, very deep things, very deep things. The commandments of God are very broad indeed. And as I told you, already we have dealt with the series of the commandments of the Lord in Romans chapter 3 verse 31 uh, when we dealt with that part. And we have, I think, about eight cases talking about the Ten Commandments. And these are very important studies that every Christian will want to learn. In fact, it clears up a lot of things. The relationship of the believer to the law of God. And this is very important for you to get so that you can refresh yourself and you can be sound in the Word of God. Now, in closing, I briefly go to point number three, which is consecration and pure worship. Consecration and pure worship. Well, I'm not going to read all the verses. I just want to read about two or three verses to you. In verse 19, after the children of Israel had seen the lightnings and they had, had seen the smoking mountain and they had heard of the thunder, then they became afraid. And look at what they said in verse 19, Exodus 20. And they said unto Moses, speak thou with us and we will hear. And but let not the Lord speak with us, lest we die. They were afraid that if those thunderings and lightnings and, and the smoke and all the fire, everything, if that continued, they felt they might die. But then they said, our consecration is, we will obey. We will hear the, we have heard the word of God. We are going to respond and we are going to obey. Now, that's a good consecration. Having heard all these words we have talked about today, what should be your attitude? Your attitude should be, Oh Lord, this requires grace. Grant me the grace. Help me to obey. In verse 20, here is what Moses said. Moses said unto the people, Fear not, for God has come to prove you that his fear may be before you, before your faces, uh, that ye sin not. Uh, do you notice something there in verse 20? Fear not. But then, on the other hand, he said, he wants his fear to be before you, before your faces, that you sin not. What does that mean? He says, hey, don't have the slavish fear. Don't fear just the lightning and the thunder, but fear God himself. And understand that our God is a consuming fire. The Lord is appearing on the mountain like this to you, to show you that he is a consuming fire. And that if you disregard and dishonor his name, and disregard the word of God, he is able to bring a fiery judgment upon you. Therefore, you fear him, you honor him, you reverence him to the point you sin not. And then in verse 24, the Lord showed them how they were to make an altar and how they were to sacrifice unto him. 
and all of earth shalt thou make unto me, and shall sacrifice thereon thy burnt offerings, and thy peace offerings, and uh, the, thy, thy sheep, and thy oxen, in all the places where I record my name. It says where your worship is, where my name is honored. You don't just go and worship anywhere. It says where your worship is, where I record my name, where I see that they are following after my word, and I put my name there as a stamp of recognition and acceptance that the Lord is here. I will come unto you, and I will bless thee. You see, that means that you have to search out for a place where the word of God is being honored, where the word of God is being obeyed, and where he has placed his blessing, where he has recorded his name. It says, you worship there and be obedient to the word of God, and I will come and I will bless you. Then it says in verse 25, if thou wilt make me an altar of stone, thou shalt not build each of hewn stone. For if thou lift up thy, thy tool upon it, Thou hast polluted it. It says, I don't want any colorful thing. Just make it the natural thing it is. And put it down like that. And that's an altar I want. Then it says, Neither shalt thou go up by steps unto mine, unto mine altar, that thy nakedness be not discovered thereon. You know what the Lord is saying here? You know, if you watch it, sometimes when somebody is going up the steps, if it's a woman that is not well dressed, Somebody down below looking up, maybe some may see some private parts that you shouldn't see. And God said, when that happens, it will bring immoral thoughts. And therefore, you build an altar and do not go up by steps. Be well dressed and make sure that there is nothing in your appearance that will bring temptation, immorality, unclean conduct to anyone at all. You know what is what this is telling us? The Lord is demanding pure worship from us as he demanded from them. In fact, if we're going to render pure worship unto God, our hearts must be pure, our lives must be holy, and our appearance must be godly and modest before we can offer pure worship unto the Lord. See all that we have learned today. What should we be saying today? We should be saying, Oh Lord, I need your grace. Oh Lord, I need your help. Because the Lord does not want us to be hearers only without being obedient to the word of the Lord. In Psalm 119, Psalm 119, verse 9. Wherewith us shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to thy word. According to thy word. Verse 11. Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. Can you say that? Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. You want to hide these words of God in your heart that you will not sin. Remember these commandments of God. Remember, you are to love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. And you are to love your neighbor like yourself. When you love your neighbor, you will not do any evil towards your neighbor. Examine your heart, examine your life with these commandments of the Lord in your prayer now. In your prayer now, go from number one to number two to number three to number four, all through to number ten. Can you say that you are free? Can you say you are a real child of God? The blood of Jesus can cleanse you and wash you whiter than snow and give you the, 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 the heart that will be so pure so that you can be consecrated fully unto the Lord and so that you will be totally holy unto the Lord. Remember, without holiness, no man shall see the Lord.